So in the following, we will look at different ways or different additional ways how to accomplish query optimization. We will start with query unnesting. The first question is, what are nested queries? Well, if you're writing SQL queries, you will see that you can write subqueries in pretty much all parts of the SQL statement. So you can have select an attribute name, comma, and then you write like a, a query, which gives additional information to the result tuple. You can write subqueries in the from part of the query, in particular also in the where clause. And often these queries can be somehow efficiently evaluated by the database system, sometimes not. In some cases, the database system is not able to unnest the um, nested query. And in some cases, the nested query is of immense cost when you want to execute it. A paper by Won Kim of 82 on optimizing SQL-like nested query suggests the classification of different types of these nestings. Let's have a look at type A. It's a very simple nested query. Here we have a predicate in the WHERE clause that is checking if the exam grade of this exam we currently look at equals the maximum grade of all exams inside this exam table. We see that the subquery here is independent from the outer query. So we could just execute it once. Let's say this gives us the result uh, five zero. And then we can, the database system can now just go through all the exams in this table and select those that have the grade equals to five zero. So this is not very difficult to unnest. And again, it's important to see that the subquery is independent from the outer query. Here we have type N, where the inner query, the one here, returns a relation, like a, a set of tuples. What we do here, we select the ID of the department where the name of the department is informatics. And then the outer query would retrieve those exams where the department ID inside the exam tuple is inside this set here, which is one or multiple IDs of, computer, of informatics departments. Also, this is getting a bit more complicated than the one above. We see also here that the inner query is independent from the outer query. So if the database system understands what's going on, it can execute this inner query once. So getting the set of all IDs of departments that are called informatics. And then in the query evaluation or the evaluation of the outer query, we can just walk through here the exam table or using an index perhaps to find those exams where the department equals to one of those IDs we have previously computed. It's also an independent subquery. Now it's getting more complicated, type J. This is a dependent, also called correlated subquery. We see that here the subquery references parts of the tuple from the outer query. So here we see we are selecting product number from a ship, shipping table S where the shipping number equals the order number of the tuple from the outer relay for the outer query. That's a dependent query. Now, if this is executed in a naive way, we would go through the tuples from the orders relation and for every product number we find inside this order table, we would execute this subquery here where the parameter in the query execution is like coming from the outer query. And this in a naive execution would cause quadratic cost, or we have to go for every tuple. From here, we have to go one time over this query, and that's very costly. So ideally, we have to rewrite it to help the database system to efficiently answer this query. And then additionally, type JA is like this type J plus aggregation. Let's go back to this example from two slides ago. We want to get 
all those tuples and all attributes from these tuples from the exams relation where the grade of the exam equals the maximum given grade for all exams in this exams table. So we have this subquery here. It's an independent subquery as we have seen and we can execute it only once. If we don't do this in a naive way and we go through all the exams from the exam table, for each exam we're executing this query. That's of course super costly, right? In this case, however, the subquery is independent, returns one constant value. We can we can um, execute it only once, like maybe like this. We're defining a parameter m, which is exactly this maximum grade, and then we can rewrite the query, select everything from exams e where e dot grade equals this constant m. Yeah, so we see that the subquery in this case here is executed only once, whereas in a naive way, the execution would be super costly, right? So let's go to this one. How can we unnest this? Well, we see we want to get all the exams from the table where the department is in a set that is given by this subquery here. And we have seen already that this is an independent subquery as well, like on the previous slide. So we can execute it only once and somehow store it. Or in a different way to solve this problem, so we don't want to um, have a costly evaluation, we want to make it cheaper, we can rewrite this query as follows. We do a join between the exams and the department table by the part department equals f.id and have an additional check on this um, name of the department. And then we get from the result only the tuples from the exam relation, all attributes of these, and we have to also use here this important the distinct command. So this basically is a semi-join. So we want to get for the, the exams table the result tuples. We don't really care about the department table, but the department table is here used in order to find those informatics departments. So let's have a look at this here, this query here. So what, what do we do? We have a selection, a simple selection over the product table. We want to get the name of the product. And additionally, we want to retrieve the city name from a company table that manufactures this product. And we want to call the result city. Now, as I mentioned already in the uh, early slide, we um, can write nested queries or subqueries pretty much everywhere. And here we see how we can use a subquery to enrich the um, attribute here that we select from the product table by writing a subquery here in the select statement. So this will give us the city name. Now, the um, execution of this query here is very costly if you're not doing it in a smart way. And if you look what Postgres is saying how to execute this would be a sequential scan over the company relation, that is the inner relation, right? The relation that is used here in the subquery. And it's not only a sequential scan, but this is sequential scan has a parameter, the filter criteria, which is that the company ID equals the company ID of the product. That means in a naive way, we go through this query for every product we have. And that's of course not good, right? This, is, this sounds very, very complicated or very expensive. We can also solve this in a different way. We can, well, we can join the product table with the company table. That's also what intuitively perhaps you would do because you see there is like some additional information in the company table, namely the city uh, and products don't, don't have the city, but products have the, the product ID. So we can use the product ID to make a join between product table and company table. And this is exactly what we are doing here. Now this can be implemented or evaluated using a hash join, for instance. 
So you see that Postgres uh, will um, now suggest doing this, and this can be more efficiently executed than this brute force implementation or evaluation in the upper case. Yeah. Note that as in this example, we assume that every product has a company. So we have um, some value here and equaling to the name we get here. If you don't have a, uh, like a company for every product, then you, you see the difference. If you don't have a product, a company for a product, you don't get a joint partner here. So then that means that the product will not uh, be uh, in a result. But here, this one will just return null because there is no company, hence there is no city for the product. So you will get here in this case, the product name and the null for the products that don't have a company. Whereas here we will not get the product at all because there's no joint partner. And now this is like, um, if you're wondering from your undergraduate courses, why there is something like a left outer join or an outer join. That's exactly the case where you would need a left outer join that would keep those products, even so they don't have a company affiliated, right? So this is like important. We will also have some examples later on where this matters to see if an unnesting is a proper unnesting or there's some differences. And this is exactly one, one of the several reasons you can make um, mistakes when you're unnesting a query. So here we have a dependent subquery. We want to get those orders from an order table O, where for this order, the product number is in, and then we have a subquery, which depends on the outer tuple. Yeah, so here we're referencing O dot order number. Now this can be unnested, again, using a join. So we're joining the order table with a shipping table. Of course, we're joining by product number and product number and shipment number where it equals the, the order number and the date should be current date. That's easy. It's just like this predicate here, right? So this can be ignored. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter here. Important is that we make the join according to this part. And of course, also to this part. And this means that we can execute a join using sort merge join or hash join, and we get away from this expensive quadratic cost naive evaluation that we would apply in this top case, in the, in the, in the case on the top. Because here, naive way, we would go through all the tuples from the order relation, and for each tuple, we would execute this query, right? Where the order number is the parameter we will ingest in this subquery. And that's, that's of course, um, costly, a uh, join is usually much cheaper to evaluate. It is important if you're not so familiar with SQL um, to get really into this, to really write some queries to see what's going on here and also to understand by maybe going back to the undergraduate material to really see what these individual queries are computing. Because if you do unnesting later on in the exam or in the exercises, we all assume that we that you know already SQL pretty well, so you're understanding why these two queries are equivalent. Now some more examples, um, again, in dependent subquery, we have now the subquery, the dependent one, not in the where clause, like in the example before, but here we have it in the distinct clause. So we have here a table company. I want to get distinct company name, comma, and now we use this funny looking construct, the subquery in the select clause to count for the for this company, the number of products this company is manufacturing. So this can be done using this query. It looks somehow a bit odd because it's like a nesting in the select statement, but often this um, is very handy to write because it's so intuitive to do it. So you want to get um, your companies and you want to get the company name. And then you might say, okay, I don't want to have only the company name, but I want to have something else in addition. And then you say comma, and then you're writing a subquery. And you can have another subquery, so you can enrich 
the information you're getting by the query by writing more and more of these nested subqueries. But in a naive way, of course, they are expensive to evaluate because you would go for every tuple from this relation C and executing this subquery, which is costly, of course. You don't want to do that. So how can we solve this problem? Well, what are we doing here? We um, have a count for the products a company is manufacturing. And we want to bring this together with the company name. So where is the count of the number of products? It's in product and we have the company table. So we make a join again. We are joining company and product by the company ID, which is given as primary and foreign key in these two tables. And then we are grouping here um, based on the company name and we're returning company name and count. Right, so this is like the intuitive way how you um, how you would write it. So if you if I tell you please write this query, probably like most of you will anyway write this, and some will write this. But you see they are equivalent. The only question is, are they really equivalent in terms of like everything? It's really perfectly equivalent, right? So it's equivalent. There's no such thing than a pretty much equivalent. So is this now correct? Is this honest thing correct? Well, what's happening to companies that do not have any products? Here, we will just get a count of zero because there's no product for this specific company. And here we will have no result for this company because the company would not find a joining tuple in the product table. So again, here we have to pay attention that this is not, in this case, not correct because of this funny cases of these corner cases but that's exactly what is what is required if you say you can rewrite a query or database system says it can rewrite the query to an unnested query but then we have to make sure that this is really correct and there are many cases where we do these little mistakes and then this means that the result is not the same as we would get in the query that was initially written by the user and perhaps the user wrote this query in order to include those with a null with, without uh, products and here we would have uh, the problem that we don't have them, right? And the solution is using a left order join, as already mentioned earlier. Okay, let's get a bit more into complicated queries. So what are we doing here? We computing the company names that have products cheaper than 150. How do we write this? Well. Select distinct, in this case, company name from the company table where exists parenthesis opening. We want to get all the products from that, from that company with a price less than 150. And whenever there is some result here, that means the company manufactures something, then the company will also be in the result. This is what this exist is doing. Now, the question is how do we unnest this? Or can we unnest this? This exists is like um, kind of expensive and how can we write it in a different way using an unnested way? First of all, this can also be written for completeness. We can also write it using in and any instead of exist, but this will not really make the problem go away of this unnesting, right? So how can we write this using in and any? Well, we can say, get me the company names where the company ID is in, parenthesis opening. Get me from the product table those company IDs where the product is cheaper than 150 for the same company, of course. So that's the same query as before. And we can also say with any, we want to get the company name from the company table where 150 is larger than any of the tuples in this subquery. So this is this is the same thing as, as the exist one. Let's have a look how we can unnest this. So let's have a look at this one. Again, it was the exist one that we had. So how can we unnest this? So again, we can unnest this using a join because it means 
well, what we have here means you want to get the company names from companies that have a product which is cheaper than 150. And look what we're doing here. Anyway, we're looking in the subquery for the company that had that matches the company here. Right? So the products here that are manufactured from a company here. And that's the join basically. So we can write this as a join between company and product. And the join predicate is this one here. Company ID is matching and the price is cheaper than 150. So you see that this exist quantification is very easy to unest because that's essentially what a join is doing. The join is searching for tuples from one side that find a join partner from the other side, from the other input relation. And that's exactly here what needs to be done. So here the distinct one, of course, is doing the same as here, or to be more precise, here, this makes more sense. Here, this was not really required if you're assuming that there are no duplicate company names in the company table. But since you cannot assume that this is like um, um, like anyway needed, or well, it makes sense to have distinct, otherwise you're getting multiple company, uh, like five times the same name perhaps. And here, it, it's also clear why we need that here, because we have a join and the company might manufacture multiple products. So if you're only doing select company name here, you might you get every company as often as it has products. And even maybe perhaps the same company or different companies have the same name. But this is also something to consider if this is really the same query, query we can come up with or we come up with after unnesting. As we have seen in the previous examples, queries that have an existential quantifier are relatively easy to unnest. Unfortunately, queries that have a universal quantifier are not so easy to unnest. Let's have a look at this example. We want to find all companies that have only products below 150. That means a, a company that has one or more products larger or equal than 150 in price should not qualify. We can express this query using not exist, which demands that this subquery here is empty. And the subquery is checking if there is a product manufactured by the company with a price larger or equal than 150. So here you see the difference to the existential quantifier, which can be solved or unnested using a join, because a join inherently searches for join partners and the tuple qualifies from one relation if it finds a joint partner from the other relation. This is not the concept of universal quantification because here we have to find companies that do not have any match, right? So this is inherently more complicated to, to execute or to compute. We can give, of course, here also alternate formulations because we did that already for the previous examples using all and not in, but they will not unnest this. It's just like a different way to express this. This query is not really easy to unnest, if at all feasible or easy to execute efficiently. So here's another example of a nested query. This is a so-called dependent join. So let's see what the query is doing. We want to get from the student relations and the exam relation, the names and the course name of the um, course the student attended. So we, we need to join these two, obviously. And not only this, because that would be simply a join, but we also have a criterion that says the grade of this exam the student took should be the minimum grade for all the exams this student took. So let's say we, we look at the German grading system where smaller grade means better grade. And let's say there's a student that has a grade of 1.3, which is the best grade among all the exams he or she took. In this case, we would return the student name and the course name of all the courses where this student got a 1.3. The subquery here is depending on the outer query because we refer to the student ID. This is a so-called dependent join. In a brute force 
execution, we would perform the join between student and exams here. And for every tuple that is a match, we check if the create is equal to this subquery here, which of course is very expensive to do. So the previous query can be rewritten as follows. Of course, we are still interested in the name and the course of the student. And what, the, what we do here is a trick. We have this inner query now, which is an independent subquery. And here we compute for every student the best grade he or she had. That means we go over the exam table, we group by the student ID, and we aggregate using the minimum aggregation function so that this temporary table here that we call M contains student ID, comma, best grade of the student. And then we take this table M, the student table and the exam table, we perform a join between the student table and the exam table. And additionally, now, using this temporary table M, we make a join between the student ID within M and the student ID of the student's table. And the grade has to be the grade that we pre-computed or given in this M temporary table, right? So this is like the equivalent query to the query before, but it can be more efficiently computed because here we can just apply any join algorithm that we can think of. It's still a nested query, but the subquery here is not a dependent subquery. And this is good because it can be evaluated much more efficiently. The same idea is expressed here in this query. We get the company name and the product name where the price of the product is the most expensive price of all products that the company is offering. So it's pretty much the same query as before. Just we look here for the maximum, not the minimum, but essentially it is the same idea. And it has the same problem here because we have a dependent subquery and the naive brute force implementation would be that we perform the join between company and product and for all those uh, joins partners we find we have to evaluate if the price is indeed equal to this one here and this is of course expensive to evaluate for all join partners to check this condition which is uh, causing in the brute force evaluation like a scan over the product table and an aggregation. Below you see what Postgres suggests at the query evaluation plan and we can go one slide further to see what this query evaluation plan means. The problem here is not the hash join, but the problem is hidden here what is called subplan 1. And this is exactly the problem of computing the maximum product price. with the filter condition being that we look only for companies with a company ID equal to the company ID from the outer part of the query. And this is where the cost problem appears. More formally, the dependent join can be defined as follows. We have dependent join between table one and table two as the concatenation of the tuples from one and the other relation, for which we have the following criterion. T1 is from T1, yeah, okay. But now it comes, T2 is uh, not only from T2, but it is from T2, where T2 is parameterized with a tuple from T1. Yeah. And then we have another criterion, some predicate over the concatenate, concatenated tuple. And you see the big difference between this dependent join and the regular join, which is like only the cross product and the selection predicate P. Here, the dependency means that we have T2, not entirely, but only certain tuples of T2, which depend on tuple T1 from T1.
Again, why do we do unnesting? In general, we have to help the database system to perform the query more efficiently. And specifically for the dependent join, this is a very costly operation. The naive implementation would be done, or the naive evaluation would be done using nested loops. But if we can rewrite this dependent join using a regular join as we just did, we can um, apply different implementations of the join operator, which gives more flexibility and hopefully also better performance.